Hello, my name is Sama, and welcome to Mediocre Guidance. Well, it is peak holiday season here in North America, and that means capitalism is running rampant. And I thought this would be a really great time to talk about my experience overcoming terrible, terrible debt. <laughs> the D word, debt. My channel is more leaning towards the emotional and spiritual side of things. So I thought we could shine a spotlight on debt because although it is a very practical, like earthly matter, I feel like we don't really talk about the emotional toll that debt takes on a person and even their family. So I wanted to talk about my experience overcoming severe debt and hopefully this could maybe help someone <laughs> who is either going through the same thing or has gone through the same thing and just know that you are not alone. I feel like debt impacts so many people, but nobody talks about it because of the stigma and the shame associated with it. So let's do it. I fell into debt in my mid 20s. Up until that point, I was living at home with my parents and anything I earned was basically like straight up profit. <laughs> because the luxury and privilege of being able to stay with my parents meant that my living expenses were taken care of and so I was just a baller. <laughs> Even though I started working very young, I started working when I was 14 years old and I was earning $7.15 at the time, but it was all like cashola. I just did not understand the value of a dollar. And then when I was 25, I moved out from living with my parents. And uh, I went across the country, really. So I was quite far away from them. I was spreading my wings and being super independent. But I also was a dum-dum. And I <laughs> didn't really know how to manage my money with all this newfound freedom. So I got a little carried away. I own my house, which I know is like a huge privilege. And I feel like this whole story comes from a place of privilege <laughs> because I'm very grateful for everything I have in my life. But uh, when I first got my house, I was a little too house proud and I just got carried away buying furniture and decor and just making it my own pad. It landed me in some serious debt. And at the same time, my stupid heart fell for this guy who took advantage of me financially quite badly and at that time I was just too young and naive to set boundaries <laughs> but you know when Cupid's arrow hits love is blind who knows what we do when we're in love uh, anyways so about two years into living on my own I racked up 54,000 Canadian dollars of debt which is an astronomical amount given my very middle class income <laughs> and so I started panicking. I was making my minimum payments and thankfully I wasn't at the point of getting collection calls or anything but it was scary. I just I knew I was drowning and I couldn't keep up with my expenses the way things were going so I filed a consumer proposal, which here in Canada is basically one step short of bankruptcy. I was super embarrassed and nervous, and you know what's crazy is even if you are looking to file a consumer proposal, there are companies out there that will just hound you to choose them as like your consumer proposal provider. Like to this day, I will get emails from these like consumer proposal companies who will be like, are you still in debt? Do you still need our help? It's very aggressive how they come after you. And of course, when you're at the point of needing a consumer proposal, like your self-esteem is at rock bottom. So ugh, it was just really gross. It gave me all the ick. So even though I was proactive and filed that consumer proposal, it obviously tanked my credit score and I was blacklisted <laughs> with the Canadian government and with all financial institutions in Canada. Like if I wanted a line of credit to try and pay off my high interest credit card, they were like, screw you, you don't know how to manage your money. <laughs> so that was painful. I'm laughing as a coping mechanism, but it was actually very painful. With a consumer proposal, that flag on your credit score is there for a minimum of seven years, assuming you've paid off your consumer proposal debt. 
and it basically excludes you from being eligible for loans that have a low interest rate for you know getting a new mortgage or anything like it's it was a time of true hell for me in trying to overcome my debt on top of that I don't know if you can tell by looking at my brown face I am South Asian and growing up in South Asian culture being in debt or having debt is a very taboo topic it's a matter of shame to have any sort of financial burden I'm sure this applies to other cultures outside of South Asian culture so let me know in the comments if you relate on top of that my dad is an accountant. So I grew up with him being very micromanagery about our funds as a family. My dad is the type of guy who will wear his underwear until there's like so many holes that there's really no fabric left. And he just like expects everyone around him to be like that as well. Until I got my own bank account, every little transaction was scrutinized. You can imagine how ashamed I was to have become independent and then basically ruined it <laughs> with poor choices. And I know like a lot of people are like, oh, well, if you didn't eat takeout so much and you didn't have your Starbucks every day, you'd, you'd have, have enough money. money. I actually was not a huge spender in terms of that sort of thing. I had a social life, so I would go out with friends to have meals and, but I remember like I would portion my meals. I would make sure there were leftovers that I could bring home and have the next day to get the most value. And let's consider that retail therapy is an actual thing. A lot of people, myself included, find comfort in shopping when we're stressed. You know when you go online shopping and there's like a million pop-ups that are like, sign up for a newsletter and you'll get 10% off. Like, welcome to the club, get your discount. I was such a sucker for those. And uh, it's like the Las Vegas strip on some of these websites. Like I've been to ones where you get to spin a wheel and like, if you're lucky, you can get the 50% off. Spoiler alert, it's never that much. It's like, I think it maxes out at 20% mo at the most. It's obviously preset. But anyways, I feel like between how websites are set up for online shopping and social media ads, it's just so easy to get pulled in. I have talked about this in a previous video on how these companies do not care about your financial health. <laughs> they just want to get as much of your hard-earned money as they can, which is fine. That's how capitalism works. It's still up to me as a consumer to be responsible with my money. So I understand that. But what really grinds my gears is how credit card companies work. They are profiting off of the knowledge that you will not be able to pay off your full amount. That's what they're betting on. That's what they're hoping for so that they can make money out of ridiculously high interest rates. I'm just saddened by the business model of credit card companies. They obviously prey on the most vulnerable. They are profiting off of those who cannot pay back their interest, never mind the principal amount. And I don't know, I just feel like that's bad. <laughs> like, I don't know, I feel like maybe that's inhumane. To add insult to injury, if you can't pay off your minimum payment, which it's like a compounding snowball that just gets bigger and bigger, they then will harass you and like threaten you with letters and phone calls as if you are a criminal <laughs> committing a crime. It's like, dude, you put me in this situation where I can't pay off my minimum payment. And of course, this is assuming that like you are a decent human being who really is trying to get out of debt and you're not taking advantage of any sort of like credit system. I know there are people out there who may be doing that and trying to like get away with fraud or whatever, but for the average person who genuinely wants to get out of debt, it's very humiliating and embarrassing to have a credit card company then basically tell you that you're a bad person for not being able to make your minimum payments. So like I mentioned, it was a seven year period from when I started my consumer proposal to when it fell off, which was just a little earlier this year. So that's very exciting. But I remember during that time, I worked a job that was pretty toxic. And I mean that quite literally, because once I was required to work standing in poo water, I'm not joking, 
<laughs> I mentioned that it was a health and safety hazard to my boss. And she said that I had to stay and fulfill orders uh, and I couldn't leave. So that's what I mean when I say toxic <laughs> on multiple levels. And so I had applied to a job at uh, a a well-renowned company and it was a position that I felt would really advance my career and I was super excited because I nailed the interview. I was feeling really hopeful and optimistic about getting myself out of a bad situation and I remember I was at my shitty job <laughs> and I was like doing my thing and I got the email notification on my phone and so I like dropped what I was doing and I looked at the email and I had been rejected for no other reason than that my credit score wasn't high enough. And I remember I used going on my lunch break as an excuse. I went to my car and I broke down crying for half an hour straight. I just bawled because I felt so trapped and helpless in that moment that my performance, my good merit, my skills and experience were all canceled out by my poor credit score. And I understand from the company's perspective, it's a security risk. Maybe I can take bribes and so that's a red flag. That's okay. I wasn't mad. I was just very sad with my situation because I was doing my best at that time to set aside every extra dollar I had to put towards my debt. And it was really difficult. I know those people who are able to pay their debt in full or, you know, have manageable payments. Maybe they just don't spend that much. I feel like there's a tendency to look down upon people who cannot pay off their debt in full. I want to encourage everyone to bring back the humanity when you're considering somebody who is in debt and to know that there's such a huge emotional toll that it takes and it's very embarrassing and it's very humiliating and I know I tried my very best and it, was, it wasn't enough. There were many, many years until I got a job that paid me more than minimum wage. It was just never enough. And if I didn't have my parents to lean back on, I would probably have lost my house by now. So um, please treat people with compassion. <laughs> Uh, there are many reasons someone can fall into poverty that really have nothing to do with their lack of judgment or their poor financial management. It could be a wide variety of things. So please be kind is my message. Okay, so I want to bring up Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Hopefully I'm saying that right. And that was brought up by, hold up, I have a source. I need to look at it. It is an idea in psychology proposed by American psychologist Abraham Maslow in his 1943 paper, A Theory of Human Motivation, published in the journal Psychological Review. And as you can see, the bottom two tiers are those of physiological needs and safety. So physiological needs are basically shelter, food, water, whereas safety is not feeling threatened and like you're in fight or flight mode <laughs> every single moment of your life. And so those two tiers are very important. And I bring them up because when you're in financial duress, all your energy goes into thoughts of trying to save yourself <laughs> from this mess. And your needs for safety are compromised at that point. I think that especially if you're leaning towards spirituality, we tend to forget that people need to meet their basic needs before they can be open and even have the energy to think about anything beyond their physical safety, which includes mental safety and emotional safety. I'm sure we all know someone who goes through heartache in relationships because of financial insecurity. Not having enough finances, whether that's living in poverty or not being able to keep up with your expenses, even if you are earning a decent wage, that is very damaging to multiple areas of your life. Spirituality, which is closer to the top of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it needs to come after 
a person feel stable and secure. I always used to wonder like why rich people were more likely to become spiritual. I mean, look at the title of the book, The Monk Who Sold His Ferrari. Like, are you kidding me? Where is the monk who sold his Mazda? Because that's me. I also participated in this discussion about spirituality and one of the speakers was talking about million dollar investments in his company and how he had to pray to God to get this investment to come in. And I was like, bruh, I have like $19 and 10 cents in my checking account. Uh, like help a sister out. <laughs> it makes more sense now, now that I've been through a phase of my life where I was financially insecure. And that is just that it consumes all your thoughts. You can't worry about matters outside of your earthly existence when all you can think about is how are you going to pay your next bill and if you'll be able to keep the roof over your head and a car in your driveway. So I compel you that spirituality should always be like an open door and not an oncoming freight train. We need to let spirituality just be available for people when they are ready for it. And we need to understand if someone isn't ready for it, that's okay they probably have something else going on in their lives that is more important to them and that they need to deal with first. Spirituality is more of an invitation and a very relaxed, chill invitation. This is why Jesus was known as the fisher of men. And even Siddhartha Gautama or Buddha was so chill. To be spiritual means that you attract people naturally through your ability to lead by example. And that's very important that we meet people where they're at. I'm now able to discuss spirituality through this channel because I'm in a place of financial health. Finally, I feel very lucky to be in this place and I know that not everybody is here yet. And so the fact that I am able to devote time and energy into making these videos is a huge privilege and a blessing from God. And of course, I prayed my way through all seven years of my consumer proposal, and there were many times when I thought that God was not coming through for me. But of course, as always, in hindsight, I grew a lot, I learned a lot, and I'm hoping and praying that my story can maybe help somebody out there. And if it does, then that means it was worth it. Thank you so very much for letting me share my story with you guys. I hope you found even a little smidgen of it helpful and interesting. Next time, we're going to bring this whole concept of hierarchies into discussion with A Course in Miracles, of course. And we're going to talk about how the whole concept of hierarchies doesn't even exist in the kingdom of heaven and who we are and our true divine nature. So until then, thank you very much for watching and supporting this channel. I will see you guys next time. Have a great week ahead. Bye-bye!